Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and evening. Welcome to TCI's webinar on activating the urban health system to deliver adolescent and youth friendly health services. Please um, type in your name and where you're joining from this morning or this afternoon or evening your time. We're really excited to share with you some of our reflections over the past three and a half um, years or so on our AYSRH programming. We're gonna promptly get started um, because we have a very full schedule today and we're excited um, to welcome you. My name is Lisa Moicambo and I'm the Knowledge Management Lead for TCI. Um, I'm joined with a number of my colleagues that I'll introduce you to throughout the presentation or webinar. If you run into any technical issues, my colleague Kim Martin is also here um, to help along the way. So um, if you will please, we'll be offering live French um, translation. So please, um, if you'd like to listen in French, click on the interpretation icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then click on French. You'll have the option to mute the original audio in English so you don't hear that in the background. Because we are providing live trans interpretation, I'm sorry, you may notice that we are speaking a little slowly and pausing with transitions um, as we move slides to give our great interpreters a chance to catch up with us. So please select French or English depending on the language that you speak. So just a few logistics. Um, each presenter will have about seven to nine minutes to talk specifically about um, a specific AYSRH um, program area um, in their country or regional context. Um, before we do that, we'll hear some opening remarks and we'll have a pause after we hear from about three to four speakers to take some questions for them. And then we'll have an additional two to three speakers and take some questions after them. So during the presentations, we'd ask that you type in your questions in the Q&A box, preferably. We'll do our best to monitor the chat as well, um, but if you can try for the Q&A box, that would be very helpful. Because we're going to have limited time, we, do, we will still collect all your questions and we will like to continue the conversation on TCI University's community of practice and make sure to also send out the Q&A with the recording um, so that you can have all the answers to the questions that you have. The webinar is being recorded and the recording and um, the PDF of the um, slides will be available shortly after in a few days. So once again, welcome everybody um, to today's webinar. As you may or may not know, um, TCI, the Challenge Initiative is funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bayer AG, Comic Relief, and other private ph philanthropists. TCI aims to ensure greater self-reliance of local governments to scale up family planning and AYSRH high impact interventions leading to sustained improvements in urban health systems and increased use of modern contraception, especially among the urban poor. Adolescent and Youth Sexual and Reproductive Health Programming was added onto the TCI platform in January 2018 and officially launched with a Master Trainer of Coaches and Trainers workshop in Kampala, Uganda in March 2018. With three years of implementation under our belt, we would like to take this time to share with you some of our achievements and learnings related to scaling up these evidence-based and promising AYSRH interventions across 42 cities in eight countries in Africa and Asia. I'd like to now introduce um, TCI's um, Senior Program Officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, Gwen Hainsworth, to share with us a few opening remarks. Over to you, Gwen. Thank you, Lisa. 
Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. The adolescent and youth population is currently the largest in history at 1.8 billion in 2016 and growing. And it's expected to exceed 2 billion by 2050. Adolescents and youth make up a significant proportion of women of reproductive age. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 41% of women of reproductive age are between the ages of 15 and 24. Yet historically, the family planning or FP ecosystem has not been responsive nor designed to meet the needs of adolescents and youth. The good news is that we're seeing shifts in how countries consider adolescents and youth. Increasingly, countries recognize that addressing the SRH and contraceptive needs of young people is critical to achieving progress towards their FP goals and the SDGs. We see this play out in country commitments and plans. For example, 26 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have prioritized adolescents and youth in FP and SRH country commitments, global funding mechanisms, and regional platforms. We also see countries increasingly integrating AYSRH within their FP and SRH programs, and not just seeing AYSRH as an add-on or a separate approach. Within the global architecture, we've seen a considerable shift in the attention on, on adolescents and youth including efforts to more meaningfully engage young people in shaping the agenda and narrative around AYSRH. We've also seen this shift in regional platforms such as the Ouagadougou Partnership, which sees adolescents and youth as vital to disrupting current trends and establishing new norms in the region, given that young people comprise such a large portion of the population and the prevalence of early marriage and adolescent fertility. The OP strategy sees young people not as some discrete population segment, but really as the main target group to accelerate FP progress in the region. These global and regional shifts have partly come about in response to increased demand from countries, but have also helped to catalyze prioritization at country level. While this progress to more meaningfully address the needs of adolescents and youth within existing FP and SRH programs is encouraging, I would put forward that the challenge ahead is how do we do this at scale and in true partnership with young people if we truly want to see a lasting impact. In the past five years, the foundation has played a critical role in evaluating the importance, excuse me, and elevating the importance of adolescents and youth within the broader FP and SRH agendas. We have made a range of investments from testing new solutions to address barriers that young people face in accessing and using contraception, to improving adolescent and youth data, to supporting youth engagement and leadership. We've also fostered strategic partnerships with other donors and development partners, including USAID, FCDO, private foundations, WHO, FP2020, which is now FP2030, and the OP to advance the AYSRH agenda. Under our new strategy, meeting the needs of adolescent girls and young women will be critical to reaching our family planning goals. We are investing in key interventions to ensure adolescents and youth have the information, services, and tools they need to plan their futures. For example, eliminating policy restrictions in our priority countries that limit young people's access to contraception and expanding the range of methods available through drug shops and pharmacies where many young people seek services. We will also continue to engage with country governments in our priority geographies and with our global scaling levers such as TCI, WHO, UNFPA, and the World Bank and the GFF to scale high impact practices and strengthen systems to respond to the contraceptive and SRH needs of young people. As our largest global investment focused on urban areas, TCI NextGen will build on what's been learned under the first phase of TCI in terms of building local government's capacity to implement AYSRH high impact interventions and meaningfully engage young people while scaling up to new geographies. I hope as we hear from today's presenters, they will offer lessons and insights that will be applicable to other contexts and programs as we collectively work to meet the challenge ahead in improving AYSRH outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. 
we're very excited to learn more from each other today as to what we have um, experienced in terms of challenges and lessons learned relating to scaling these interventions and how we can continue to refine those learnings. Now I'd like to introduce my first school, oh, sorry. Um, now we will watch a short video and hear from our TCI AYSRH technical advisor, Krishna Bose, after this video. Youth are confronting a challenging world. To face it, they require self-determination. The Challenge Initiative believes that when youth have access to quality sexual and reproductive health services, they have agency to thrive. TCI's platform is designed for scale, providing cities a blueprint to implement their own high-impact programs for youth, the fastest-growing segment of the global population. Yet many governments don't specifically fund youth programs. That's because they often report on contraceptive use for all women without separating the data by age. So TCI is supporting cities to make the invisible visible. Uganda's age disaggregated data enable TCI to support the government in making informed programming decisions. Contraceptive use increased in Senegal and Benin as well. And improved data collection in Cote d'Ivoire revealed opportunities to reach more youth. Advocacy is another key strategy. TCI called on the Indian government to fund Adolescent Health Days and coached youth leaders in West Africa to promote free contraceptive Wednesdays. Their efforts paid off. Developing engaging messages for youth is foundational to TCI's work. Like a TV campaign in India aimed at young first-time parents, community theatre in Nigeria about sexual and reproductive health issues, and a digital media campaign in West Africa. Bias is commonplace among providers too. They often refuse contraceptives for unmarried youth and those with one or two children. So TCI coaches providers on how to deliver non-judgmental sexual and reproductive health care to youth. Together, these strategies have greatly accelerated youth access to sexual and reproductive health information and services. And as new cities seek to partner with TCI, there's real opportunity and promise that together we can effectively address the sexual and reproductive health needs of youth. Wonderful. I hope you enjoyed that video. And now over to Krishna to share more about our AYSRH concentric circle strategy. Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, following this brief introductory video based on TCI's AYSRH strategy, here is a quick glance at our conceptual and programmatic approach based on the cumulative experience of the work that many of you in the audience have supported over the years. We are standing on your shoulders. From the get-go, we emphasize the importance of data visibility to support adolescents engage and city officials respond. As many of you know, this is particularly challenging in a lot of countries where the health management information system does not allow age disaggregation. In fact, uh, typically the forms that are used to collate facility level data include only one age bracket of, for women of reproductive age 15 to 49 years, though facility registers include the ages of all clients. Having age disaggregated data for 10 to 14, 15 to 19, and 20 to 24 year olds enormously strengthens uh, focused advocacy in what we are calling youth-friendly cities and allows uh, the discussion during monthly or quarterly municipal and health sector meetings where adolescents and youth participate with decision makers in supporting decisions, including relevant budget items, ensuring funding and strategies for human resources, as well as service quality improvement. 
Despite entering this third decade of the 21st century, we know how easy it is to circulate false and misinformation that can seriously compromise the health and development, particularly of adolescents who live in societies where their sexuality is a taboo subject. TCI therefore supports the uh, systems in place in urban disadvantaged settings for effective social mobilization and demand generation with developing engaging messages for youth and not only with and for adolescents and youth, but also for their gatekeepers who uh, have norms and perceptions that create significant barriers for adolescents and youth in accessing reliable information, services, and particularly contraceptive commodities. And it is only uh, responsible to match such increasing demand with quality service delivery particularly in making contraceptives more accessible, acceptable, affordable, and appropriate. Addressing provider bias is central to ensuring improved and effective coverage of contraceptive services, but quality improvement for TCI also includes whole facility orientation of all staff on site to support the uh, typically lone staff member typical, uh, who has been trained off site. The Ministry of Health or Department of Health's supportive supervision system ensures periodic quality assessments at these facilities. In supporting these four approaches for improved uh, AYSRH outcome, adolescent and youth sexual and reproductive health, which I will abbreviate as AYSRH, we have visualized the, these four strategies here uh, on this slide. Next slide, please. The TCI's platform actually uh, has efforts that provides a system strengthening approach in applying these four conceptual programmatic approaches. And it activates or supports the activation of urban, municipal, health and community structures in the cities that it is supporting uh, AYSRH improvement in. TCI thus partners with city governments through a demand driven process where city governments approach TCI to join them in strengthening systems for improving AYSRH outcomes, committing their own financial and human resources and political will. TCI then matches with challenge funding for the city selected based on epidemiologic systems and geographic considerations. In the three years or so of support for AYSRH, TCI has received 96 expressions of interest uh, some um, abbreviated here as EOIs from cities for improving AYSRH outcomes. There is a real concern and commitment to improving adolescent and youth sexual and reproductive health. It currently supports 42 city uh, governance systems in eight countries, covering a population of about 4.5 million youth. TCI is also poised to expand to another 20 cities in the next few months. In this decade of universal health coverage and effective scale with improvement in access to quality health services, TCI's AYSRE strategy specifically engage with youth for monitoring, advocacy and segmented demand generation to uh, match quality standards based service delivery. We are in the process of documenting the lessons you will hear about today from our hub partners for a special supplement of the Global Health Science and Practice Journal. So look out for our November 2022 edition. Thank you so much. Thank you, Krishna. So now we have, um, we've ordered the regional and country uh, level presentations according to each of the concentric circle strategy. So let's go to East Africa and hear from our colleague, Albert, who is the technical officer of AYSRH programs for Uganda and share with us how TCI has worked with local governments in East Africa to make data on youth sexual and reproductive health visible. Over to you, Albert. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. Greetings and happy new year to everyone. Um, very privileged this afternoon, this morning and evening to share with you our story, our journey of how TCI has supported local governments in East Africa to make AYSRH data visible. I will be switching off my, my, my video just for purposes of internet connectivity. Uh, 
as TCI East Africa, really our goal was to, to reduce energy pregnancies in supported uh, geography so cities. And doing this by increasing NYSRH access to quality contraceptive services across the three countries that TCI supports in East Africa. Next slide. So as East, East Africa, uh, as TCI, we use different sources of data. So we use HMIS, the Health Management Information System, but also use Program Management Information System, really to support local governments to make what is invisible, visible. And like we said that what is not measured really receives little or no attention. So TCI is supporting these local governments to make this data visible. And in East Africa, it's only Uganda, whose HMI system really uh, disaggregates data for adolescents by age, by method, and type of visit. While in Kenya and Tanzania, the HMI system does not disaggregate data. So as TCI, we are taking active efforts to collect this data via our PMIS system to estimate clear volumes for AYSR for, for, for adolescents and youth age 15 to 24. Next slide. Okay, thank you. So uh, this slide really tries to highlight the results of the, the data collection that we that we support the local governments to do. So we are looking at determining the changes in uh, adolescents and youth 15 to 24 years in FP uptake since when we started the implementation of AY SRH program in, in East Africa. So when you look at this slide, and based on uh, this AY uh, PMIS exercise, where we compare the information reported on HMIS with the retrospective data collection at the facility through the facility registers, uh, we were able to utilize FP client volume calculations to determine performance of AY storage. And as you can see, the AY client volume has really increased. However, COVID did not have, did COVID did impact the increases. Like you can see in the gray, uh, in the shaded area, you can see that when we were hit uh, by COVID around March of 2020, we saw some slight uh, decline, but the data is starting to rebound. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, this slide tries to highlight how we, we support local government really to, to model uh, HMIS using ANC first visit to determine the teenage pregnancy rates in the TCI supported geographies. So uh, we modeled the HMIS data for TCI for, for this geography, for, for TCI supported geographies, really to provide an estimate on data on pregnant women, uh, age 10 to, to 19, uh, 15 to 19, uh, attending first NC. So we look really at those who were pregnant and not delivered. So we collect this data on a monthly basis, really to help us and uh, get information that the local governments can use to make informed decisions. And like we can see a decline in the combined teenage pregnancy rate year by year for the TCI supported geographies across the three East African countries, I mentioned Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. And uh, if you look at this, the, 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 the graph, the line graphs, you can see that Kenya was driving a lot of the decline but we can also see how COVID has really impacted the decline around March, like I really mentioned in the previous slide. So this can be uh, for two reasons. Uh, you see when we hit with COVID, so the countries took drastic measures to limit the infection. And so measures like the lockdown that kept people in homes and they could not move from their home to facilities, to access services, but also the adolescents who were confined in the home, some of them with abusive uh, uh, guardians, abusive uh, people, some of them ended up getting pregnant. And that really uh, explains why we see some uh, uh, slight increase in terms of 
teenage pregnancies. So next slide. So this slide really uh, highlights how we aggressively adapted our strategy in light of COVID uh, to engage the pharmacies to bridge service delivery gaps and ensuring access to contraceptive services by adolescents and youth, but also including the older women. So we really, uh, we took an incremental rollout approach right from 184 pharmacies and drug shops that we started with in, in 2019 to 760 pharmacies and drug shops currently. So next slide. Thank you. So like you can look at, like you can see this slide really tries to highlight how we, we collect the data from the pharmacies and how this data is really disaggregated by age, uh, by method. And like you can see, it really shows how we also trying to link these pharmacies and drug shops to public facilities and ensure that the clients can be able to receive services that are not offered within the drug shops and pharmacies. So services like the, the LACs that are not really uh, offered by these uh, drug shops and pharmacies, the clients are referred public facilities, like you can see in green color to access them. And that's what we are doing as, as TCI, how we are supporting the local governments really to them that pharmacies can be an option, that drug shops can be an option for adolescents and youth to access the services. And generally in East Africa, a range of services are offered, counseling, condom, emergency contraceptives, but also injectables for the case of Uganda and Kenya. Next slide. Yeah, so this slide uh, tries to, 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 to highlight the linkage that I've, I've already talked about of pharmacy data on HMIS. How are we trying to support local governments to link the pharmacies and drug shops to report directly through the HMIS. So what is happening right now is that we have seen they participate in meetings that happen at local government level where they share their achievements, they share their learnings and also challenges and they are supported. And these meetings have helped to, to strengthen collaboration and networking between the pharmacies and the, and the governments. And then the other thing is that we have seen this data really being used to showcase, but also to advocate for inclusion of drug shops and pharmacies into the national system so that they're able to report directly to the national HMI system. And then the other thing that we are seeing, for example, in Kenya, that experiences from pharmacies being used to guide the rollout of the HMI's pharmacy report that is currently happening in Kenya, and last but not least, in Tanzania, the health management teams, they have adapted the HMIS FP register and the summary tool to support pharmacies to report their data. And then lastly, in Tanzania, the pharmacies have, are linked to nearby public facilities where their data is reported on monthly basis so that they submit their data in, in near, to nearby facilities and that data is reported to, national, to the HMI system. And therefore their contribution is really, uh, it becomes visible, but also helps really to, to, to advocate for, for support, but also uh, uh, linkage of these uh, pharmacies really to the national system. And this is happening across board, across the three countries of East Africa. Thank you, thank you so much. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Albert, for your presentation. Now we'll hear from Nigeria and our TCI AYSRH program manager, Dorcas, will introduce our first speaker. Thanks so very much for having us here. This is Pam, the Adolescent Health Desk of Sapra from Plechi State is going to take us through the journey between Adolescent Health Desk Office of the Plechi State Government and TCI. Um, Mrs. Pam, over to you. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me on this platform. The Plateau State journey so far, during our partnership with the Challenge Initiative and the Plateau State Government, Plateau State have a total population of about 4.7 million people 
and 1.2 out of this total population constitute of adolescent and young people. Prior to TCI partnership in the state, adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health program was not well structured. There was no costed implementation plan. We had adolescent health decks, but not that functional. There was also issue of inadequate funding in the state. And we also have inadequate involvement of young people in adolescent and sexual reproductive health need issues in the state. So when we look at the facilities and communities at large too in the state before the implementation, there was also cultural and religious bias. We also have issues of provider bias. We have parent young people communication on sexual reproductive health not common because of our culture in the state. So what has worked for us in the state so far during our partnership with the Challenge Initiative is advocating for funding for adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health program using the multi-sectoral coordination platform like the Adolescent Health and Development Technical Working Group. We also have this technical working group constituting of members from our line ministries like the Ministry for Youth and Sport, Ministry of Information, Ministry for Budget and Planning. Also, we have the Adolescent Health Dex, which also is advocating for funding. And we also have the Advocacy Core Group, Life Planning Ambassadors in the state, and use of media to amplify issues on adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health. So another thing that has worked for us in the state is adolescent youth participation across state structures and community structures. We have 22 young people that have been identified to serve as life planning ambassadors. These life planning ambassadors in the state constitute those young people from age 18 to 35. And they are working voluntarily to interface between advocacy, uh, policymakers, community structures like the religious leaders, traditional leaders. And they also interface between the young people themselves to tell them about adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health issues in the state. We also have participation of these young people that have been trained as LP life planning ambassadors into existing structures in the state. Structures like the advocacy core group, we also have the media, we have the social behavioral change committee. We also have some of them represented into the adolescent technical working group. As the national guideline also stipulates that one of them should serve as a co-chair. So it has also happened in Plateau State. On another thing that has worked for us is the state-led youth-friendly facilities. We have about 25 facilities in the state that are piloting this adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health services in the state. And the national minimum package for services and standards has been incorporated into the family planning supportive supervision checklist, which has also helped us to render quality services to young people in the state. We also have 25 facilities that were on yellow before this implementation, but they are now on green using the adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health services metrics. Because of so many activities that we have engaged in through the technical support from tech, uh, TCI, like coaching, training of service providers to remove all these bias. And we also have presence of coaches in the state. They, these coaches help us in coaching and mentoring clinical and non-clinical staff during whole site orientations, during on the job training, and some of these facilities staff use a TCI university to help in improving their services to young people. So the results that we have achieved so far in the state are over 5,000 young people have taken up methods, various methods of contraceptives in the state. And we also have release of funds from sources like the local government derivative fund. We also have the state health funds and other sources amounting to about 56 million naira for family planning and adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health program in the state. 
over this period of time that we have spent with the challenge initiative in the state. The state government through the Save One Million Life has also released some funds for printing and distribution of data tools, which are used to document service uptake in the facilities. And this help in decision making. So we also have a state unified costed implementation plan. And we also have funding sources like the basic healthcare provision funds now that has been released to the health facilities. And these funds help in renovation of facilities in order to make them youth friendly in the state. We also have adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health issues now receiving government support as a result of proactive engagement with these structures that are now in the state, like the technical working group, life planning ambassadors, advocacy co group. Thank you and over. I will now call on one of our last life planning ambassadors, Joy Sanato, to come on board. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for having me on this platform. Being a life planning ambassador for me has sharpened my skills, especially as regards to issues bordering on AYSRH. And after our inauguration as life planning ambassadors, like Mrs. Pam mentioned, we were infused into state structures, such as the advocacy core group, social behavioral change committee, technical working group, as well as the interfaith forum. We've been able to advocate for release of funds, and we also track those budgets to ensure that they are releases as well as utilization. And for the past two years, the State Ministry of Health and Board has released budgets for integrated services for FP and AYSRH programs. We've also had media collaborations, and as a result, we've had free media slots from stations such as the state-owned PR TV and also private stations such as JFM and Unity FM, and we've utilized international days, such as the World Contraceptive Day, where the Adolescent Health Dex officer and I used the media to talk about um, young people's access to modern contraceptive in Plateau State, and also to dispel myths and misconceptions surrounding young people's access to sexual reproductive health and services. We've also had um, traditional and religious leaders speak in favor of young people's access to modern contraceptive in the state, which was uncommon before now due to our religious and social cultural barriers. But we are slowly breaking the silence on young people's access to um, modern contraceptive. And overall, it has amplified the voices of young persons in the state and also increase youth participation in health response in Plateau State. Thank you and over. Thank you, Mrs. Pam and Joyce. Now we will travel to the Philippines to hear from Jenny Macaran, learning and development expert of TCI Philippines, and Mandel Zoe Bay, Laganzan City Councilor, SK Federation President, Dipolog City. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning and mabuhay from the Philippines. In 2019, about seven live births were born to Filipino children ages 10 to 14 every day. And when COVID-19 hit, it was forecasted to increase despite the lockdowns. The Philippine government strongly believes that the youth sector has a vital role in addressing adolescent pregnancies and births as seen in the issued Executive Order 141 and in the centers of areas of participation of Sangguni Ang Kabataan. But how competent were our youth to take this role? This was why we started this program to build youth capacity and engage them to AYSRH. Incorporating the learnings from our previous partnerships with USAID and UNFPA, on youth engagement. I, as the learning and development expert of the Zwilig Family Foundation and the Challenge Initiative here in the Philippines, led the development and implementation of one of the TCI Philippine high impact approaches we called Leadership for Adolescent and Youth Friendly Cities Program for Youth Leaders. It is a leadership program for AYSRH 
with a three-day module followed by 12 months practicum for the elected and non-elected youth group leaders serving the identified poorest and with high, uh, with high adolescent pregnancies and births villages in the Philippines. 53 youth leaders are currently engaged coming from the cities of Cagayan de Oro, Puerto Princesa, and De Polo. The Life C4 Youth Leaders contributes as well to the different approaches focusing on demand generation, supply, and governance. These youth leaders are coached by the city officials, the TCI Philippine Hub Team, and the leaders from the Commission on Population and Development. The interest and passion and commitment of these youth leaders exceeded our expectations, but true to what we believe in, youth should be the owners of their own issue. Most of the participants were elected officials and NGO youth leaders, where they received inputs and sessions on bridging leadership, systems thinking, stakeholder processes like dialogue, behavior change design, where the deep dive activity was an eye opener for all. After a guided thought process, the youth leaders come up with at least 21 proposed behavior change interventions. Interventions that would promote less risky behaviors and would prevent early pregnancies and second pregnancies. Parenting talks, AYSRH youth activities for segmented youth groups through seminars and social media campaigns, community outreaches to provide AYSRs, AYSRH services are its examples. After months to the program, these youth leaders sourced their own funds, allotted their time and energy, and even partnered with different stakeholders with the end in mind of contributing to the reduction of teenage pregnancies in their own cities. This youth-led intervention could, could be classified as to physical, where tools like database and facilities were set up to deliver specific youth group services. There are also digital interventions that aim to deliver information through social media and other means. Interventions resulted to tiny habits due to advocacies where these youth leaders become the trainers, facilitators, youth peer educators to meet with the youth and even other generations like the Barangay Council officials, the parents, to discuss about the possible barriers to accessing the right AYSRH information and services. And lastly, interventions that would produce new institutional arrangements, such as allocating a regular annual AYSRH funds coming from the portion of the national city and barangay SK funds. We in the TCI Philippine Hub, we commit to continue, coach, and monitor and evaluate these youth led projects and provide more capacity building for this. 53 youth leaders as we utilize the lessons learned and continuously address the remaining challenges. We will also train additional youth leaders this year and advocate this to the to this to the National Youth Commission for a possible diffusion to other cities. To get more and give us more glimpse of what is the Philippine experience may we call on our youth leader who is also a member of the city leadership team and is instrumental in gathering the 15 youth leaders in the Polog. I would like to call on Honorable Mandal Zoe Logasan. Good morning and mapuhay from the Philippines. Thank you, Ms. Chen, for the introduction. And I am honored and blessed to represent the Pollock City and on behalf of my co-SKs and youth leaders in presenting our milestone. Now let me share to you our journey before, after, and with TCI or the Challenge Initiative Program and our improvements as leaders and ambassadors of AYSRH. Before the TCI Live see the Sangguniang Kapadaan of the Pollock were able to create and implement activities for the youth, especially in addressing AYSRH issues. We implemented AYSRH activities with little or superficial information and data about AYSRH. Thus, our programs pro 
projects and interventions were not sustainable. Dipol but Dipolog SKs and the rest of the Dipolog youth leaders in the city were dreaming of a program such as TCI to help us address our teenage pregnancy status in the city that will for sure give a lasting impact on the lives of the adolescents and youth. So after the TCI Life C and also as a beneficiary of the program, the Sangguniang Kabataan and other youth leaders of the Pollock City conducted a deep dive activity in our respective communities to know firsthand the causes of teenage pregnancy. And we also interviewed teen moms, especially in their homes. So thereafter, we were taught how to do stakeholder mapping and analysis, which resulted to us having a multi-sectoral approach in reducing teenage pregnancy in our city. Truly, there was a change in mindset and behavior within the youth leaders in the public city that propelled us to do more AYSRH advocacy campaigns in our respective communities with ownership and commitment. We were able to reach a number of 840 youth and adolescents and 420 parents. Our advocacy campaigns yielded a decrease in our ABR and increase in MCPR in the ages between 10 to 19 years old. Also, the active support of our mayor, Daryl Dexter Deepway, he committed to give us a bigger and wider space where the youth leaders can conduct peer-to-peer -peer counseling situated in the new city legislative building and a significant budget for children and youth facility. And now, with TCI Live C, our commitment as SK leaders is very clear as our budget for AYSRH and other health concerns significantly increased to 324% in our City Youth Development Plan of 2022 to 2024 and our Annual Youth Development Action Plan of 2022. So our role as youth leaders is to ensure that right choices and responsive AYSRH services are accessible to our young people. It is my personal vision that a child should not be burying a child. And that would be all. Thank you for listening and God bless everyone. So thank you to our speakers. Um, as you've heard, we learned about making data visible in East Africa and advocating for youth-friendly cities in Nigeria and the Philippines. So now we're going to take um, just a few questions. I noticed about three um, similar questions were asked um, to Albert and the East Africa team related to the linkage of data from pharmacies to the public um, health system. And there, it was asked about, are there any incentives for pharmacies? But I think um, more broadly speaking, I, my understanding of that question is, what has motivated the pharmacies and drug shops to take part in TCI and to provide their data to the public health system? So Albert, um, and I believe his colleague um, Maureen is here. Can you please um, answer that question? Well, thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you, colleagues, for the question. Uh, I want to say that uh, as East Africa, we, we engaged the farmers' associations, for example, in Kenya, but also we are working with the district drug shop and pharmacy inspectors to enroll these drug shops right from the start. So there was high level of government uh, ownership, participation, in the selection and, uh, and onboarding of these pharmacies and drug shops on board. So what really happens was building their capacity to provide quality services and also providing, equipping them with the job aids and guidelines to support them to offer quality services. That alone was a, a strong motivation for them because it helped them to attract uh, more clients to their, to their facilities to access services when facilities come and they find a drug shop or pharmacy, it has a register that is really named the national government. They have uh, guidelines, they have a job aid that it talks about that helps them in counseling. They have, they have the medical eligibility criteria 
and I also able to assess their clients and cancel them. So that really motivated them to offer the services, but also helped in attracting more clients. And at the end of the day, they were able to report because they had the inner drive, the inner motivation to report this data. But the above all was the issue of that linkage with the with public facilities, but also with the government. So these pharmacies sitting in meetings where there's a district health, health officer, where there is a director of medical services, and are able to talk, we talk with them and able to share their achievements, share their challenges, and they're also able to receive responses from these people. It strengthened that bond, that collaboration that really motivated them to continuously report this data to the national system. So that is really that 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 was a motivation because we don't give them money, we don't uh, give them anything, but just building their capacity and sharpening them. Uh, Maureen, if you have something you can add, over to you. Thank you, Albert. Um, I'm going to take one question also, um, it looks like for Nigeria, and I believe Joyce has already even answered in the Q&A, but kind of along the same lines of um, incentivizing or motivating. Um, so in the Nigerian context, um, how are you motivating um, life planning ambassadors to be engaged? What advice would you give to other hubs, but also other um, projects and implementers who are struggling with engaging ambassadors? Would you like to unmute yourself, Joyce, and share with us what you typed? Okay. Um, thank you very much. So there are no incentives if I'm to answer the first part. However, the motivation for me is um, seeing young people, positive changes among adolescents, following interventions, and also the engagement and interactions we have with government is also a motivation as we are drawn to plan and implement activities for young people like us. And my advice to other hubs is to engage young people who are passionate about AYSR and also to engage government stakeholders infuse them into state structures and also provide continuous coaching. Um, community involvement is also key in um, engaging young ambassadors. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joyce. And please continue typing in your questions into the chat, I mean, into the Q&A. Um, as you'll see, our colleagues are responding in, live, um, chatting back, but if, um, and we'll collect all of these and share the responses and questions um, with the recording later. Um, so if we can't get to them all today, don't worry, stay tuned. But right now, um, we'd like to continue our journey through the concentric circles and now learn from our India stra team strategy for AYSRH demand generation. Please welcome Hitesh Sahini, Deputy Chief of Party of TCI India to share their experience. Hitesh? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Sorry, I was the one hearing my voice only. Sorry for this, I was on mute. So uh, I think I'm audible now. Yeah, we can hear you, thank you. Yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, greetings from India. Uh, before uh, we see the India story in the next uh, few slides, uh, just a small question or task uh, for you all. Uh, uh, meet a young woman who become uh, who became a mother or a first-time mother rather recently and ask, uh, when do you want your next or a second child? The answer that I got on doing a similar exercise was uh, not now. So keeping this in mind, let's move forward. We all know that the various studies uh, and uh, the data has suggested that the unmet need is highest uh, among the younger cohort between the age group of 15 to 24 years. And uh, our communication and demand generation strategy hinged around establishing proven uh, solutions 
uh, that have worked with the local government to implement uh, uh, and is effective in not only reaching out uh, to the youth, but also increasing uh, their contraceptive uptake and uh, knowledge towards the contraception. So next slide. Uh, so let's uh, look at uh, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, uh, from both the courts, that is the first time parents and the unmarried adolescents. So when we uh, see the first time parents, uh, some of the bigger challenges uh, with respect to the first time parents are that uh, with low correct knowledge uh, on timely planning of the uh, family, uh, mixed with the, uh, their inability to negotiate use of family planning methods uh, with the gatekeepers uh, such as mother-in-law, uh, etc. the social vulnerabilities uh, that they face and uh, being parity one, uh, they are deprioritized among the family planning uh, value chain. Uh, next slide, please. So keeping these challenges in mind, the focus was on enabling key influencers uh, through the government efforts and interventions. Uh, on the demand side, Asha were coached on uh, listing of the uh, first time parents, uh, counseling of the FTPs and referring them to a fixed day service at the nearest uh, uh, facility. Similarly, on the supply side, uh, coaching the coaches uh, to conduct the whole site orientation for uh, uh, value clarification uh, of all the uh, service providers uh, to provide the unbiased and uh, non-judgmental services uh, to the young first-time parents. And uh, on the enabling environment uh, uh, front, having a strategic uh, discussion with the chief medical officers to drive the city's adolescent sexual reproductive health activities through the government and the National Adolescent Health Program, which is RKSK resources, to ensure quality family planning services are offered to the first time parents. Next slide, please. So now that the influencers were identified, the program through the government master coaches uh, led the coaching of the ASHAs on a systematic approach uh, using two by two matrix and updating their records uh, uh, to reorganize the data in order to identify and counsel uh, the uh, first time parent non-users and negotiate with the gatekeepers. This helped the ASHAs to saturate the first time parent non-users and uh, improvement in the uptake of the contraceptives among the first time parents was observed in the population based uh, output tracking survey when we compared with the sites without the FTP strategy. So this was a significant uh, improvement noted there. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, similarly, when we look at the unmarried adolescents, uh, uh, sorry, uh, unmarried adolescent youth, their challenges are around uh, limited access uh, to credible and non-judgmental advice, low correct knowledge of contraception, and a limited understanding of self-risk of uh, uh, getting pregnant. Next slide. So uh, the Adolescent Health Day is one of the strategies to achieve uh, the objective of the government of India's National Adolescent Health Program, uh, which is the RKSK program to improve the preventive services and health seeking behavior of the unmarried adolescent. And uh, uh, here the activity actually is a non-starter uh, in the urban uh, cities, uh, given the assumption that the youth have access to the SRH information and services, which is uh, most often not the case. Uh, as a result, TCI working with the RKSK uh, demonstrated not only how UPSCs can become youth-friendly sites for facility adolescent health days, uh, but also leveraged uh, the urban health and nutrition days uh, to facilitate the community adolescent health days, which was uh, innovation and which uh, these are the group activities for girls and boys respectively to create buzz for facility HDs and to refer the adolescent youths requiring sexual reproductive health services to the 
nearest uh, facility. For community AHD, uh, the challenge initiative for healthy cities uh, coaches the uh, ANMs, which are the auxiliary nurse midwives, to facilitate the session and trigger the discussion of uh, on the sexual reproductive health uh, issues and the use of the behavior change communication tools and interactive games. Uh, this was participated by the leadership from the uh, National Adolescent Health Program, uh, which is an RKSK program, and uh, they, you know, eagerly adopted this, and uh, now it is led by the government. And in fact, this innovation has now led in uh, the cities uh, around ten cities, uh, additional cities uh, uh, of of the program area. So, meanwhile, the interactive games uh, or tools help to build the recognition of the risk of unprotected. Uh, sex and unwanted pregnancy, uh, build the recognition for importance of consent in a sexual relationship, and last but not the least, uh, educating on the emergency contraceptives. So these all tools uh, were in a way that, you know, adolescent could easily connect and take home the messages which were very important to bring about a behavior change uh, and knowledge towards the contraception. Next slide. And as goes with the youth, the digital media approach to connect with youths got a huge response. Um, uh, uh, these WhatsApp messages uh, adopted by the health government and RKSK were circulated through their platform for educating and creating awareness among the youths on the thematic uh, messages on SRH and other youth-related topics. So this whole approach of having the engaging topic and the demand generation activities using the government platforms and also creating some innovations in form of uh, community adolescent health days, leveraging uh, the Urban Health Nutrition Day has started delivering uh, great results in terms of uh, when we see the number of footfalls of the adolescent, and especially when we see for the FTPs, the uptake of the contraception versus the cities where the FTP strategy was not. Thank you so much, Hitesh. So as we all know, as Hitesh mentioned, the importance of linking demand activities with service improvements. So um, last but certainly not least, we'd like to hear from our esteemed colleague, um, Josefa Avos, Regional Manager of the AYSRH Program of TCI Franc Francophone West Africa, share with us the experience of addressing provider bias and service quality in the region. Please let re me remind you to put on the interpretation um, channel and select English or French. Um, Josephat will be providing his presentation in French. Off to you, Josephat. Merci. Nous sommes très heureux de partager avec vous notre expérience d'offre des services adaptés aux adolescents et jeunes en Afrique de l'Ouest francophone à travers la plateforme de TCI. Pour concevoir notre approche, nous nous sommes basés sur les caractéristiques des services adaptés, les standards de qualité élaborés par l'OMS et les outils qui sont déjà élaborés, que l'on utilise déjà pour améliorer la qualité des services. Donc, nous n'avons rien inventé, nous sommes partis donc de l'existant pour concevoir notre stratégie, bien sûr, en tenant compte de nos cercles concentriques. Diapo. Slide, OK. Maintenant, nous avons donc, nous sommes partis de tout ce qui existait que je vais donc de citer pour donc alors élaborer une grille d'évaluation de la qualité des services. Et cette grille comporte... Euh, cinq euh, composantes et ces cinq composantes ont été déclinées en 15 critères pour évaluer les compétences des prestataires, les caractéristiques donc alors du point de prestation de service ou encore les services offerts, sinon la prestation de service même, le feedback des clients adolescents et jeunes, la communication avec les jeunes au sein des PPS, c'est-à-dire les points de prestation de service et au sein de la communauté, puis enfin les données du trimestre qui précède celui de l'évaluation de la qualité des services. Comme nous l'avons donc dit, c'est une évaluation qui se fait de manière périodique et 
on, 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 mène à, 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 on met en œuvre les, les, les actions correctrices qui sont issues de, de, de l'évaluation et on, on, on repasse encore après pour voir ce que cela a donné. Diapo Bien. Maintenant, comment on déroule une activité comme celle que je venais donc alors de dire Comment nous avons déroulé donc notre activité H et bon, ça comporte sept étapes. Hein? Bon, maintenant, il faut noter que la préparation est quelque chose de très très important de, dans, dans la réussite donc alors de la mise en œuvre donc de cette approche. Maintenant, on, on commence par les équipes cadres des districts, des, 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 des régions et, c est, c est, c est, et, et des zones sanitaires. C'est d'abord ces équipes que nous formons et c'est eux qui assurent donc alors la collecte des données, qui est une étape importante dans le déroulement de l'activité. On, 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 on va dans les centres, on, on, on cause avec le, les, les prestataires, on les observe, et, et on parle avec eux, on fait un débriefing avec eux, on, 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 on note, on classe les PPS. On élabore donc des plans pour réduire, non, pour résoudre plutôt les problèmes qui ont été constatés et après, on repasse encore pour voir comment ça a évolué. Diapo. Bien. Maintenant, je vous ai dit que nous passons, on connaît les données, on classe les PPS. En combien de catégories? Trois catégories. Il y a donc les PPS que nous, nous, nous appelons les peu adaptés qui sont en rouge jusqu'à 59%, donc alors des, des, des scores, ils sont toujours donc alors en rouge. Il y a les PPS que nous classons comme adapt, moyennement adaptés, c'est-à-dire jusqu'à 79%, donc alors des scores. Et il y a encore des PPS que nous classons comme des PPS euh, 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 adaptés. Donc alors, il y a trois catégories, peu adaptés, moyennement adaptés et adaptés. Maintenant, après avoir classé les, 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 les PPS, nous élaborons donc alors un plan de réduction, donc alors, euh, 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 de, non, de, 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 de résolution des problèmes que nous avons constatés à base donc d'un canevas que nous avons euh, 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 dressé les colonnes en dessous, donc alors, de, 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 de cette grille que je vais donc de vous euh, 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 montrer ou qui est encore euh, euh, à l'écran. Diapo. Bien. Maintenant, après avoir conçu donc l'approche, nous devons aider les villes à mettre cela en eux parce que notre rôle est d'accompagner les villes. Bon, on retient à la date d'aujourd'hui que nous avons au moins aidé plus de 300 centres à mettre en œuvre cette approche dans plusieurs villes. J'ai cité Cotonou, Abome Kalavi, Bobo Diolasso, Abidjan, Ziguincho, tout ça, c'est dans les pays où nous sommes aujourd'hui. Nous sommes dans cinq pays en Afrique de l'Est francophone et nous aidons donc alors donc, les, les villes donc, dans ces pays à mettre en œuvre cette approche pour améliorer il y aurait la qualité donc, des services offerts aux adolescents et jeunes. Nous formons donc alors les, les prestataires sur la réduction des biens et nous pouvons donc dire aujourd'hui qu'il y a plus de 1400 prestataires qui ont été formés dans ce sens. Et également, nous, nous, nous postulons que pour que les services soient de bonne qualité, il faut que ce soit tout le, tout le site qui soit impliqué dans, dans l'offre des, des services adaptés aux besoins des, 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 des adolescents et jeunes, y compris les gardiens, les chauffeurs et autres. Donc, nous appelons cela l'orientation de tout le personnel du site. Et donc, on a aidé au moins plus de 200 centres à mettre en œuvre cette approche et les résultats tout à l'heure, on va constater cela. Mais après avoir fait tout ça, bien sûr, on accompagne les prestataires et les PPS avec notre stratégie phare que nous appelons donc le coaching. Diapo. Slide. Bien. Nous avons donc alors pris l'exemple d'une seule ville que nous appelons UCOS, Union des communes du Zou, c'est au Bénin. Nous avons pu faire trois évaluations successives donc, dans cette euh, 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 ville. Et, 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 bon, la première en juin 2019, la deuxième en mars 2020. Notez bien que mars 2020, c'est le début de l'épidémie en Afrique de l'Ouest francophone. Et maintenant, on a fait l'autre un an encore plus tard, en mars 2021. Bon, la première évaluation a eu lieu un an après la mise en œuvre de deux programmes bon, qui ont été intensifs. Et ça a donc permis d'avoir déjà à l'entame, c'est-à-dire un an après, bien sûr, 53% donc des PPS que nous avons classés comme adaptés. Mais neuf mois après, on est parti, bien sûr que les interventions continuaient, on a constaté que donc alors c'est arrivé à 64%. Mais lorsque nous sommes répartis un an plus tard, en pleine crise de COVID, bien sûr, on a constaté que 50 
des PPS qui étaient adaptés ont shifté vers les PPS moyennement adaptés ou encore peu adaptés. Bon, on va revenir après sur euh, les facteurs qui expliquent euh, ce, ce déclin donc, de la qualité des services que nous avons observé. Diapo. Slide. Bien. De toute façon, nous sommes partis du postulat que si les services sont de bonne qualité, ils seront utilisés par les adolescents et jeunes. Ce que nous avons constaté, non seulement dans Lucos, mais aussi dans d'autres villes telles que Ziguinchor, toutes les fois que les services sont donc de bonne qualité, ils sont mieux utilisés entre 2 et 13 fois plus. C'est-à-dire, si un service, si un PPS offre des services adaptés, le taux d'utilisation des méthodes contraceptives à travers ce centre est de 2 à 13 fois plus que un centre qui n'est pas adapté. Donc, il faut miser sur donc, la qualité pour pouvoir faire utiliser donc, les services par les adolescents et jeunes. Ça, c'est notre conclusion. Nous continuons. Diapo. Bien. Maintenant, je vous avais promis de revenir sur euh, les facteurs. Maintenant, je vous avais promis tout à l'heure que je vais revenir sur les facteurs qui ont expliqué la chute de la qualité des services dans l'Union des communes du Zou au Bénin. Mais on a noté quatre facteurs principaux. D'abord, les compétences des prestataires. Les prestataires compétents, lorsqu'ils sont mutés d'un centre à un autre, ils se déplacent avec la qualité. Ça, c'est simple. Deuxièmement, il y a les services privés. En fait, l'outil a été conçu pour pouvoir accroître aussi la demande et offrir donc les services selon les, services, selon les critères des services adaptés. Mais les privés ne sont pas prêts à offrir des services gratuits. Et aussi, ils ne sont pas prêts à aller dans les communautés pour parler, pour causer avec les jeunes et autres sur la planification familiale ou encore les questions liées à la santé de la reproduction. Donc, ça fait que la qualité, notre outil, les classe comme des services non adaptés, bien sûr qu'il y a d'autres facteurs tels que la disponibilité donc, des produits contraceptifs et autres. Maintenant, on a aussi eu la situation de COVID surtout. On a constaté que pendant que la COVID donc, alors, est arrivée, la gratuité des services a été arrêtée dans la plupart des centres, 68% des, des, des centres. Et encore, la plupart donc, de, de ces centres ont connu une rupture de stock des produits contraceptifs. Maintenant, on, on, a, on a aussi connu cette histoire de la distanciation sociale qui a fait que les jeunes ont peur de venir dans les centres, de peur d'attraper le, 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 le VIH. Les prestataires n'arrivent pas à organiser des activités de sensibilisation dans les PPS et aussi n'arrivent pas à sortir pour aller donc alors rencontrer les jeunes pour pouvoir donc leur parler au sein de la communauté. Du coup, ça a influencé donc la qualité des services et on a connu donc alors une chute, c'est-à-dire des PPS qui étaient adaptés sont passés donc alors de adaptés à moyennement adapté ou encore un peu adapté. Mais aussi, on a noté d'une manière générale que les jeunes sont très faiblement impliqués dans l'amélioration de la qualité des services. Alors, conclusion, dernier diapo. On a conclu que un niveau atteint en matière de qualité n'est jamais figé. Ça bouge. Donc, alors, ce qu'il faut faire, il faut toujours des efforts continus pour maintenir la qualité et encore transformer donc alors les centres qui sont rouges en centres verts. Deuxièmement, on a constaté que lorsque l'on adapte les services existants aux besoins des jeunes, c'est bénéfique, c'est rentable, c'est efficient. Donc alors, au lieu de créer des services spéciaux, on a eu des articles de référence qui nous ont donc dit que les services isolés ne sont pas efficaces et effectivement, ils ne sont pas efficaces. Donc alors, il faut adapter les services existants aux besoins des adolescents et jeunes pour pouvoir donc alors accroître leur accès. L'autre aussi, il faut miser sur la participation des jeunes. Et enfin, il y a l'institutionnalisation des approches, notamment celle de la qualité des services telle que nous l'avons donc conçue. Bien sûr, nous sommes en train de travailler avec les districts sanitaires pour que l'on puisse intégrer notre outil ou l'outil et dans la supervision au, au quotidien et que cela devienne une auto-évaluation. Mais aussi, on travaille avec le niveau national pour que l'esprit ou encore la stratégie, l'approche des services adaptés à travers les services existants soit intégrée dans les politiques nationales au niveau des pays. Enfin, l'environnement juridique est très important. 
parce que ça protège, ça rassure donc les prestataires pour offrir donc des services de qualité. J'attends bien donc alors des questions pour pouvoir donc alors répondre aux préoccupations des uns et des autres. Merci. Thank you so much, Josephat and Hitesh. We ask for questions to be put in the chat in the Q and A. I noticed. Thank you, Jenny and um, Deepdi and Krishna and teams for responding. Like I said, we'll continue to collect these questions and um, have them um, answered on the TCI University. But now I'd like to. Um, move our conversation to hear some time from Dr. Chandramoli's reflections on TCI's AYSRH strategy and what all this means for scaling AYSRH programming. So over to you, Chandra. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. This has been a, a fascinating session. And I listened to this with a lot of interest. Um, I've taken down three points uh, that I'd like to share with you. The first is that uh, in many places, health facility level data is unseen and invisible. And private pharmacy data is not included in government statistics. Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania have shown how data can be made visible and used to make a case for action. This is extremely important. I loved uh, the way the pharmacy data was integrated uh, into government statistics and how Albert explained that this was through government intervention. The second problem is that government interest in supporting adolescent health programs is not recognized and is not tapped. Nigeria and Philippines, and I think India too, have shown that when informed and engaged, local government officials provide support, initiate activities, and provide substantive funding for such work. It was wonderful to see the examples of both Nigeria and Philippines, that you know, a range of players uh, can make a contribution to this, including young people. The third problem is that government family planning programs do not prioritize young people. India showed that local government bodies were ready to put in place both tailored approaches to provide contraceptives and to create demand by two groups who are generally left out, first-time parents and unmarried young people. Two other issues. One issue is that health worker performance is recognized as a big barrier to adolescents and young people obtaining contraceptives. And training, often one-off training, is the only approach used to address this problem. Bena, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, and Senegal, I believe I've missed one country, have shown the value of using fairly quick, fairly quick, clean health, health facility assessment and a package of actions to improve health worker performance. It's possible to do this. You don't need scientific studies um, which go on for endlessly. And you certainly need to move away from a one-off training approach. So many interesting lessons to learn from this work. But for me, the key message is that by the year 2030, 60% of the world's urban population will be under the age of 18. 60% will be under the age of 18. Um, we cannot ignore this group and we cannot only focus on um, the rural areas. It's not either or. We need tailored approaches for urban areas and young people in urban areas. And the last point I'd like to uh, leave with you is over the last uh, 
two years, uh, we've not been able to travel to many places. And so what we have had to do is to tap into the expertise of local um, uh, professionals. And what is wonderful to see in all these country examples is what a wealth of expertise there is in countries and around countries. And moving forward, as we move forward in the world beyond COVID, we certainly should not go back to flying experts from around the world to provide support when uh, experts in countries can play the lead as they've shown here. Thank you very much and congratulations to TCI for bringing together this wonderful body of expertise. And uh, it's a privilege to work with you. And I look forward very much to working with you, supporting you in pulling this together to what Krishna said in her introductory comments, a journal supplement built on experience in global health science and practice. Thank you very much. And over to you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thank you to my esteemed colleagues for their wonderful presentations, for all the insights shared by Gwen and Chandra. Um, I know that um, we didn't have enough time to go through all the questions, but we will continue this conversation as it's a vital conversation to have. So we'll be collecting all the questions, we'll provide responses and make sure to share those with you with the recording and slides. But also please feel free to um, register and join TCI University's community of practice. The link is on the screen to continue this discussion with our panelists and many more of our AYSRH experts um, across the world. And so I don't know about you, but I feel like I've learned a lot today and I'm excited to kind of keep that learning going. Um, so in addition to the community of practice, we have a number of um, products that have been developed recently or publications that synthesize this experience. And um, those are on the screen and they're available in English and French. And we'll make sure that you have those at your fingertips as well. Um, so once again, we just really would like to thank um, all of our partners, our donors, our friends um, in making all this happen. We couldn't have done it without the commitment from the local governments um, in really driving the AYSRH programming and addressing their teenage pregnancy concerns and challenges. So thank you all. Um, and we will make sure to get out the recording and presentation to you in the coming days. Many thanks. Thank you, everyone. Well done, Krishna. Well done, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Chandra. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Hope you Thanks, have a good day. Bye -bye. All the best. Thank Happy you. New Year. Thanks to the team. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Lisa and Kim. Lisa and Kim, the dynamic duo. Merci. <laughs> Thank you, Krishna.